I had been working as a fire lookout in the Appalachian Mountains for about four years when everything changed. It was a job that suited me perfectly, secluded, with plenty of time to think and observe the vast expanse of nature from my elevated perch. The view from my tower stretched for miles, over rolling hills, thick forests, and the occasional glimmer of a river winding its way through the wilderness. From time to time, I'd spot hikers or see smoke in the distance, but for the most part, my life was solitary and uneventful. My tower, a sixty-foot structure, was perched on the edge of a small clearing atop a ridge. It was old, creaking with every gust of wind, and had probably seen better days, but it was still solid. My job was simple, keep watch for any signs of wildfire, report them, and make sure nothing burned down. It was a lonely job, sure, but I liked it that way. I preferred to stay away from people, not out of misanthropy, but because I had always found the quiet more comforting than conversation. There was a sense of peace in the isolation, but also an underlying tension that came with being alone in such a remote place. It wasn't something you could pinpoint, just a feeling, a sensation that anything could happen, and no one would know. This was the kind of place where people could vanish without a trace, where the trees and the earth could swallow you up, and no one would hear your scream. That summer had been particularly dry, with no significant rainfall in weeks. The forest was a tinderbox, just waiting for a spark. I was on high alert, scanning the horizon for any telltale signs of smoke. But aside from the usual wildlife, deer, bears, the occasional coyote, there was little to report. Until one evening. It was just after dusk, and the air had that cool, crisp feel that only comes in the mountains. I was settling in for the night, scanning the horizon one last time before going inside the tower to make a cup of coffee, when I noticed something odd. There, off to the west, maybe five or six miles away, was a small flicker of light. Not the orange glow of a campfire, but something more controlled, more purposeful, like a flashlight. Normally, hikers didn't venture this deep into the forest, especially at night. It was too easy to get lost, and the trails were poorly marked. But this light was moving, bobbing up and down as if someone was making their way through the underbrush. I grabbed my binoculars and focused in on it, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. There was definitely someone out there. I radioed the ranger station, letting them know I had spotted a light in the western sector. They told me they hadn't received any reports of hikers in that area, but would keep an eye on it. I didn't think much more of it. Maybe it was a hunter or some foolhardy camper trying to set up for the night. The next day, the light was gone, and everything seemed back to normal. The forest was quiet and the usual birds and animals went about their business. But that night, the light returned, this time closer, much closer. It was moving slowly, as if whoever was out there knew where they were going. I tried to radio the station again, but the signal was spotty. The light was maybe a mile away now, creeping through the trees like a ghost. I told myself it was probably just someone who had gotten lost but something about the way it moved felt deliberate. It wasn't erratic, like you'd expect from a lost hiker. It was smooth, methodical. The third night, the light came again. But this time, it stopped. It stopped about half a mile from my tower, and it stayed there, unmoving. I watched it for over an hour, waiting for it to continue, to fade away, but it didn't. It just hovered in the same spot, like whoever was holding the flashlight was watching me, waiting. I didn't sleep that night. The next day, I hiked down to the spot where I had seen the light. I'm not sure what I was expecting to find, maybe some old campsite or a pile of rocks, anything that could explain it. But when I got there, the ground was undisturbed. There was no sign anyone had been there. No footprints. No fire pit, nothing. That was when I first started to feel the real fear creeping in. 
If there had been someone out there, they had covered their tracks perfectly. And if it wasn't a person, then what the hell had I been watching? The following night, the light appeared again, but this time, something was different. It wasn't alone. Another light had joined it, flickering in and out of view as if two people were now out there. They moved in tandem, both inching closer to my tower. I radioed the station again, but all I got was static. I grabbed the rifle I kept under my cot, just in case of a bear, and sat by the window, staring out into the darkness, waiting. The lights got closer and closer, until they were less than a quarter of a mile away. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest, my pulse. Quickening. And then they stopped again. This time, I could hear something, branches snapping, the soft rustle of leaves underfoot. Whoever it was, they were close enough that I could hear them moving through the underbrush. I turned off my lights, crouching low by the window, hoping they couldn't see me. Minutes passed, but it felt like hours. The noises outside grew louder, more distinct. There were footsteps now, clear and deliberate, just outside the clearing. Then, silence. I waited, breath held, ears straining to catch any sound, any clue as to what was happening. But there was nothing. I crept to the door, rifle in hand, and opened it slowly, peering out into the dark. The lights were gone. No movement. No sound, just the stillness of the night. But I wasn't alone. Standing at the edge of the clearing, barely visible in the moonlight, was a figure. It wasn't holding a flashlight. It wasn't moving. It was just standing there, staring at me. I raised my rifle, my hands trembling, and shouted out, Who are you? What do you want? No response. I kept the rifle trained on the figure, my finger hovering over the trigger, waiting for it to make a move. But it just stood there, completely still, like a statue. And then, without warning, it turned and walked back into the forest, disappearing into the trees. I didn't sleep at all that night. I sat by the window, rifle in hand, watching the tree lean for any sign of movement. But nothing came. The figure was gone, and so were the lights. The next morning, I radioed the station and told them everything that had happened. They sent a team out to investigate, but they didn't find anything. No tracks, no sign of anyone having been near my tower. It was as if the figure had never existed. For the next few days, I stayed on high alert, waiting for the lights to return, for the figure to come back but the forest remained quiet. The sense of unease lingered, though, gnawing at the edges of my mind. A week later, a hiker was reported missing in the same area where I had seen the lights. They found his campsite, but no sign of the man himself. His belongings were scattered around, as if he had left in a hurry. His flashlight was still on, its battery nearly dead. I couldn't shake the feeling that the figure I had seen was connected somehow, that whoever, or whatever, it was, had something to do with the disappearance. But there was no proof, nothing tangible to tie the two together. And then, just as suddenly as it had started, the lights stopped appearing. The forest returned to its usual rhythm, and I tried to convince myself it had all been in my head. But every night, as I sat in my tower, Scanning the horizon for signs of smoke, I couldn't help but glance toward the west, toward the place where the lights had first appeared. And every time, I half expected to see them again, creeping closer, waiting just beyond the trees. It was supposed to be a regular shift, nothing more. I had signed up for the solitude. The quiet days were the only excitement came from spotting a potential fire in the distance. That's what I loved about being a fire lookout. No people, no noise. Just the wilderness and me. Of course, it wasn't always easy, long hours, unpredictable weather, but it suited me fine. 
better than being trapped in an office or dealing with people who never seemed to get the hint when you needed space. I've always been a bit of a loner. Grew up in a small town where everyone knew everyone's business, and I hated that. I needed to get away, so after school, I drifted into a few different jobs, none of which stuck, until I found my place up in the mountains. Isolation up there wasn't a downside, it was the reward. This particular post was in the Salmon Chalice National Forest, Idaho, sometime in the late 90s. I'd been stationed in the fire lookout tower for two months already, doing the rounds, keeping an eye on the horizon. I remember thinking that the mountains were starting to feel like home. The radio would crackle with occasional chatter, but mostly it was quiet. And I liked it that way. The day started normally enough. I grabbed my binoculars and scanned the valley below for any signs of smoke, same as every day. The weather was perfect, no clouds, and just the right amount of coolness to the breeze. For the first few hours, nothing stood out. Just birds, trees, and distant mountain ridges. Around midday, though, something weird caught my eye, and not the kind of weird that makes you shrug and move on. There was a flash of movement near the tree line, a quick flicker of something large but low to the ground. Deer, maybe. Elk, possibly. But this thing? It moved too fast, like a shadow that shouldn't have been there. I zoomed in with the binoculars, trying to catch a clearer look, but whatever it was had vanished. At first, I didn't think much of it. Wildlife was unpredictable, after all. But something about the speed and the way it darted between the trees stuck with me. Still, I didn't dwell on it. By late afternoon, I had already brushed it off as a trick of the light or just a fleeting animal. Around dusk, I went to check the cabin's logbook. It was routine, jotting down notes about the day, the wind direction, and any visible changes in the weather. The sun was setting, casting long shadows across the valley, when I heard something. Not loud, but distinct. The unmistakable sound of branches snapping, heavy, deliberate footfalls. I put the logbook down and grabbed my flashlight. Shining it down towards the trees below the tower, I scanned the area. Nothing. Just the usual stillness of the woods. But the sound continued, only now it was closer. I wasn't sure if I was imagining it, but I could swear the steps were more deliberate. Not the random shuffling of an animal, but someone, or something, walking with purpose. Maybe a hiker, I told myself. Though I hadn't seen anyone in days, and it was rare to see hikers this deep in the forest without hearing about them beforehand. Besides, it was late, and most people wouldn't be wandering around in the dark like this. I called out. Hello? Anybody there? No answer. The footsteps stopped as soon as I spoke. I waited, but the silence stretched on uncomfortably. There's a kind of quiet you get in the mountains that's almost oppressive, like it's pressing in on you from all sides. That was the kind of quiet I felt now, and it didn't sit well. I climbed down the tower ladder and slowly approached the trees where the noise had come from. The beam of my flashlight sliced through the darkness, revealing nothing but the usual underbrush. Just as I was about to turn back, I saw something strange, almost like a footprint, but not quite. It was too large and too deep to be from any animal I knew of. And there were more of them, leading deeper into the woods. I wasn't about to follow them. Call it a gut feeling or common sense but I wasn't going to be the idiot in one of those stories where people wander off and never come back. I took a mental note of the prince and headed back to the tower, locking the door behind me. The night stretched on, uneventful, until around midnight. That's when the radio came to life. Look out, this is base. You copy? I grabbed the receiver. This is Tower 7. Go ahead. We got reports of some missing hikers in your area. 
two people, male and female, last seen near the northern trailhead. Have you seen or heard anything unusual? My heart dropped. I thought back to the strange movement earlier in the day, then to the footprints. Couldn't be. Right? Nothing definitive, I replied. But there's been something off. I'll keep an eye out. The radio went silent for a moment before crackling back. Keep us updated. I didn't sleep much after that. My mind was racing, replaying. Everything I'd seen and heard. The missing hikers, the strange movements, the oversized prints, none of it made sense. But something was wrong. I could feel it. Around 3 a.m., I heard it again. This time, it was louder, more deliberate. Footsteps. And not just one pair, multiple. They were circling the tower now, moving in slow, deliberate patterns. I grabbed the flashlight again and leaned out the window, pointing the beam down. I saw nothing at first, just the usual shadows cast by the trees. But then, near the base of the ladder, something moved. Something tall, taller than a person, standing just beyond the range of the light. I called out again, my voice more steady than I felt. Who's there? No response, but the figure moved closer, still staying just out of full view. I stepped back, gripping the flashlight tighter. The thing, I couldn't bring myself to call it a person anymore, moved with unsettling speed, closing the distance to the ladder in seconds. I slammed the door shut and bolted it, backing away until I was against the far wall. The radio crackled again, but I didn't have time to answer. The thing was climbing the ladder now, each step slow, deliberate. The wood creaked under its weight. I grabbed the only weapon I had, a flare gun, and aimed it at the door. The footsteps grew louder, closer. I could hear heavy breathing now, just on the other side of the door. My heart was pounding so hard I thought it might explode. Then, just as suddenly as it had started, it stopped. The breathing, the footsteps, all of it, gone. I stood there for what felt like an eternity, waiting for something, anything, to happen. But nothing did. Eventually, I mustered the courage to look out the window again. The forest was still. No signs of movement, no sounds. Just the quiet I had once found so comforting, now eerie and unnatural. The radio crackled to life again. Tower 7, this is base. Do you copy? I rushed over, my hands shaking. This is Tower 7. What the hell is going on out here? We found the hikers. Or what's left of them. My blood ran cold. What do you mean? They were torn apart. No signs of a bear or mountain lion. Just, something else. I didn't respond. There was nothing to say. The next morning, I reported everything, the sounds, the footprints, the figure climbing the ladder. They sent a team out to investigate, but they found nothing. No footprints, no signs of struggle. Just the bodies of the hikers, mutilated beyond recognition. And the ladder? It was untouched, as if nothing had ever been there. I packed up my things and left that post the next day. Whatever it was that came to my tower that night, it wasn't human. I don't know what it was, and I'm not sure I ever want to know. But one thing's for sure, it's still out there. And it's hungry. I've spent countless days atop a fire tower deep in the Appalachian Mountains, watching over an endless sea of trees. The landscape is both beautiful and menacing, especially as dusk falls, draping the hills in a thickening darkness. My job as a fire lookout may sound serene, but there's a palpable isolation that can sometimes twist reality. The year was 1997, and I had just begun my third summer in the tower. Back then, 
I'd chosen this job for the solitude. The peace and quiet allowed me to escape the noise of the world below. But the longer I spent in that tower, the more I started to question that decision. Strange things happen in these woods, things you can't explain, things you don't mention to anyone because they'd never believe you. The fire lookout towers are stationed strategically across the Appalachians, miles apart. Our only contact with each other was through radio, though most of the time it remained silent, aside from the occasional weather update or check-in from the park ranger's office. It was mid-July when the odd occurrences began. My tower, set on a remote ridge, offered panoramic views of the valleys and peaks surrounding me. Usually, the worst thing I'd deal with was a storm rolling in unexpectedly, but this time something was different. One evening, just after sunset, I noticed a small flicker of light far off in the distance. It was unusual to see any light out here, especially at that time. It wasn't a campfire, too small and too sporadic. I picked up my binoculars, but the light vanished before I could get a good look. A part of me thought it was just a reflection or perhaps the last glint of the sun off a distant rock. But something about it nagged at me. The next few nights, the light returned, always in the same spot, deep in the valley, about ten miles out from the tower. Each night, it seemed closer. It wasn't a normal light, it flickered unevenly, like a candle fighting against the wind. I radioed into the ranger station to report it, but they brushed it off as campers, which made sense. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I knew these woods well. No one camped that deep in the valley without checking in, and there were no official trails that led there. One evening, I heard the first sound. It was a low, distant moan carried by the wind. At first, I thought it was an animal, a bear maybe, or an elk. But this sound wasn't right. It didn't echo the way an animal's call does. It was more like a cry, a human cry. I tried to rationalize it, chalking it up to the wind playing tricks on me. After all, the Appalachians have a way of distorting sound, especially at night. But then the light appeared again, closer than ever. That night, the radio crackled. North Ridge Lookout, this is Ranger Davis, do you copy? I grabbed the handset. Copy. This is North Ridge. Got some reports of a missing hiker. Last seen heading up the old trail near the valley. Thought you should know. Keep an eye out. My heart skipped a beat. That valley. The one where I'd seen the light. Roger that. We'll report if I see anything, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I didn't mention the light. I didn't want to sound paranoid, but inside... I felt something shift. The hiker's disappearance felt connected, though I didn't know how. That night, I couldn't sleep. I sat in the tower, binoculars in hand, scanning the valley. Around midnight, the light appeared again, closer still. This time, I could make out a faint silhouette near it. A figure, standing motionless in the dark. My blood ran cold. It wasn't the missing hiker, I knew that much. This figure was too tall, too gaunt, and it didn't move like a person. It stood there, staring, though I couldn't see its eyes, I could feel its gaze locked on me. I called it into Ranger Davis, keeping my voice steady. He didn't seem concerned. Probably just some campers, he said dismissively. We'll send someone to check it out in the morning morning? I wasn't sure I'd last until morning. The figure didn't move for hours, just stood there at the edge of the light. Then, just before dawn, it vanished, along with the light. I was exhausted but couldn't bring myself to sleep. When the sun rose, I climbed down from the tower, grabbed my rifle, and set off toward the valley. I had to know what was going on. The trail leading down was overgrown, a barely there path from years of disuse. 
I hiked for hours, the air thick with humidity and the scent of damp earth. By midday, I reached the edge of the valley where I had seen the light. My heart was pounding, both from exertion and the dread creeping up my spine. I scanned the area, searching for any sign of campers, or worse, the missing hiker. Then I saw it, a small, makeshift campsite. The fire pit was cold, the ashes long dead. Tattered clothes were scattered around, and there was something else, a smell. Rotting, decaying. I followed the stench to a shallow depression in the ground, covered loosely with leaves and branches. My stomach lurched. Inside the hole was a body. It was the hiker, what was left of him. His face was twisted in terror, eyes wide open, mouth agape as if frozen mid-scream. I backed away, bile rising in my throat. But before I could turn and run, I heard it again. That moan. This time it was closer, more distinct. It wasn't the wind. I turned, rifle in hand, scanning the trees. And there it was. The figure. It was watching me, standing just beyond the tree line, its body unnaturally thin, elongated. My hands shook as I aimed the rifle, but before I could pull the trigger, it disappeared into the shadows. I stumbled back up the trail, heart racing. By the time I reached the tower, the sun had begun to set, casting long shadows across the mountains. I radioed in the body, barely able to keep my voice steady. The rangers promised to send a team to investigate, but I knew they wouldn't find anything. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't going to leave evidence behind. The following night, I stayed awake, watching. The light didn't return, but the sense of being watched never left me. Every rustle of leaves, every creak of the tower felt like a threat. I knew that figure was still out there, waiting. Not for me, I don't think it was ever after me, but for something else, someone else. Two days later, they found another body. A camper, not far from the hiker's remains. The same look of terror frozen on their face, the same shallow grave. The official report claimed it was a bear attack, but I knew better. There were no bears here, not like that. I left the tower shortly after. Couldn't stay there, not after what I'd seen. They assigned me to a different post, somewhere further south, less remote. But even now, years later, I can't forget that figure. I've heard stories, local legends about creatures that roam the Appalachian wilderness, spirits of the lost or vengeful beings that stalk the night. I used to laugh them off as campfire tales. Not anymore. Whatever it was, it's still out there. And every time I close my eyes, I see that flicker of light in the distance, growing closer, waiting. I had always loved the solitude of my job. Perched atop the fire tower in the middle of the dense forest, I was a fire lookout, nothing more, nothing less. My job was simple, watch the horizon for the slightest hint of smoke, anything that could signal the start of a wildfire, and report it immediately. It was 1996, the kind of year where nothing much was supposed to happen, especially in the remote mountains of Idaho. The tower was my sanctuary. Standing forty feet above the tree line, it gave me a view of the sprawling forest that stretched for miles. The days were long, and the nights were quiet, with only the occasional crackle of a radio dispatch to break the silence. I never felt lonely up there. In fact, I relished the quiet, the sense that I was disconnected from everything below. Life was simple. Or at least, it was supposed to be. That summer had been unusually dry. Even by July, the air had a strange kind of stillness to it, as if the trees and the earth itself were holding their breath, waiting for something to ignite the tension. The rangers were all on edge, knowing that a single spark could light up the whole forest in a matter of hours. 
I had seen fires before, of course. They were dangerous, sure, but they were also something I understood. You saw the smoke, you tracked its progress, and the rest was up to the fire crews. But this time, something felt different. The first few days of August, the radio chatter picked up about a few missing hikers. Search teams had been sent out, but the vastness of the wilderness made it difficult to track anyone. Normally, people lost their way for a day or two, maybe more, and then reappeared, embarrassed but unharmed. Not this time. It started with two hikers, a young couple in their early twenties. They had left the trail, according to reports, wanting to explore some of the more rugged terrain near Hell's Canyon. No one had heard from them since. A few days later, a father and son went missing. Same area, same disappearance. Search crews combed through the woods with dogs, helicopters, and everything they had. But there was no sign of them, not a trace. That's when things started to get strange. In the evenings, just after sunset, I started to notice something I couldn't quite explain. Far off to the west, near the ridgeline that bordered the canyon, I saw flickers of light. At first, I thought it was the search teams using flares, maybe some campers with a fire. But the lights didn't behave like flares or campfires. They were quick, darting across the horizon, disappearing just as fast as they appeared. I radioed in a few times, but the rangers told me it was nothing to worry about. They had people out there, and everything was under control. But every night, the lights came back, always in the same spot. Always just beyond the canyon. I began to dread the evenings, waiting for those flashes of light to appear again. It was a Saturday night when things finally escalated. The wind had picked up that afternoon blowing hot and dry from the south. I was scanning the horizon when I caught sight of a thin wisp of smoke, faint but unmistakable. It was coming from the area near the canyon, exactly where the lights had been. I radioed it in immediately, feeling a tight knot form in my stomach. There was no reply at first, just static, then the faint voice of the ranger on duty. We're aware of the situation, he said. Stay in the tower, and keep us updated. That was the standard protocol, but something in his voice made me uneasy. He sounded rushed, almost nervous. I watched the smoke carefully as it began to thicken, rising higher into the sky. The wind was pushing it east, toward the more densely forested areas. If it spread, it would be out of control in no time. By the time the sun began to set, the smoke had darkened, and I could see the faint glow of fire in the distance. The search teams had pulled out earlier in the day, too risky to continue without spotting any of the missing. I was alone up there, with nothing but the wind and the crackle of the radio for company. And then the lights came back. This time, they were closer, much closer. They darted across the horizon, circling the area where the fire had started. I grabbed my binoculars, trying to make sense of what I was seeing, but it didn't help. The lights were moving too fast, almost erratically. There was something unsettling about the way they flickered in and out of sight. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong, more wrong than I had initially thought. I radioed in again, trying to explain what I was seeing. I'm telling you, there are lights out there, moving fast. It doesn't look like any kind of fire crew, I said, my voice shaking slightly. We don't have any teams out that far, came the reply. I paused, my hand gripping the radio tightly. Then what am I seeing? There was a long silence on the other end before the ranger finally responded, his voice low and almost hesitant. Just stay in the tower. We're looking into it. That was the last transmission I received. The fire continued to grow, but the lights didn't disappear. In fact, they seemed to be moving toward the flames, as if they were drawn to it. I didn't sleep that night, sitting in the tower, 
watching the fire spread. By morning, the sky was hazy with smoke, and the lights were gone. I told myself I had imagined it, that the smoke and exhaustion had played tricks on my mind. But the unease lingered. The next few days were a blur. More search teams went out, more hikers reported missing. And then the weather turned. A dry lightning storm swept through the canyon, sparking a series of fires that spread faster than anyone could contain. Evacuations were ordered, but it was too late for many. The fire consumed everything in its path, leaving behind nothing but ash and scorched earth. By the time the fires were finally brought under control, eight people were missing. No bodies were ever found, just the charred remains of campsites and scattered belongings. The official report blamed the fire, said the hikers had likely gotten caught in the blaze and hadn't been able to escape. But I knew better. Those lights, whatever they were, had something to do with it. They had been there from the beginning, flickering just beyond the reach of the fire, always watching. I tried to forget about it, to push the memory down, but it gnawed at me. A few weeks after the fires, I decided to hike out to the canyon, to see for myself what was left. The forest was a blackened wasteland, the smell of smoke still hanging in the air. I followed the old trail down toward the ridge where I had seen the lights. There wasn't much left, just burned trees and cracked earth. But as I reached the edge of the canyon, I saw something strange. There, half buried in the ash, was a ring of stones. It was small, barely noticeable, but it had clearly been arranged by human hands. In the center of the circle was a charred piece of fabric, tattered and worn, but unmistakably part of a backpack strap. I don't know what it meant but I felt a chill run down my spine as I stared at it. Whatever had happened out there, it wasn't natural. And as I turned to leave, I caught a flicker of light out of the corner of my eye, just beyond the ridge. I didn't look back. I've never been one to get spooked easily. Years working as a fire lookout deep in the Appalachian wilderness had taught me that most of what we fear out here isn't lurking in the woods, but in our heads. It's the silence, the isolation, that gets to people. The crack of a twig, the distant rustle of leaves, it all plays tricks on your mind. But I wasn't new to this. I knew better. At least, I thought I did. It was early September, the start of the drier season, when the leaves turn brittle and fires are a constant threat. I had been stationed at Calhoun Lookout, one of the older towers, perched high on a ridge overlooking miles of dense forest. It wasn't the most glamorous job, but it suited me. I liked the solitude, the simplicity of it. The tower was basic, for walls, a narrow staircase, a bed, and a small desk with a radio. The view, though, was something else. On a clear day, you could see the ridges roll for what seemed like forever. That evening, I was finishing my dinner, beans heated on a small stove, nothing fancy, when the radio crackled. Dispatch was checking in, a routine call. I responded with a thumbs up, knowing full well they couldn't see me, but habit makes you do funny things. They reminded me to keep an eye out for any unusual smoke on the horizon. The last thing we needed was a wildfire spreading through the backcountry. Everything's quiet, I replied, my voice echoing a bit in the empty room. As I stood up to stretch, I noticed the sun dipping below the horizon. The sky was bleeding into hues of orange and purple, casting long shadows across the treetops. It was peaceful. Too peaceful, maybe. It wasn't until later, when the sky had fully darkened and the only light came from my lantern and the occasional flicker of lightning far off in the distance, that I first saw the movement. A flash of white, no more than a split second, caught the corner of my eye. I whipped around, but there was nothing. Probably just a deer or a fox. The forest was full of them. 
but then I saw it again. This time, it was closer. Not a deer. Definitely not a fox. It moved too quickly, and not in that nervous, skittish way animals do. It was almost deliberate. I grabbed my flashlight, flicking it on and shining it into the trees. Nothing. The beam cut through the darkness, illuminating the dense underbrush but revealing no sign of life. I stood there for a few minutes, heart thudding in my chest, telling myself it was nothing. As I turned to head back inside, I heard a sound. A low, rhythmic thud. Footsteps. But not like any animal. They were heavier. A person, maybe? But who would be out here, miles from any road or trail, without a flashlight or gear? Hey! I called out, my voice firm but cautious. Who's out there? No answer. Just the wind rustling through the leaves. I waited, my hand hovering over the small hunting knife I kept clipped to my belt. After what felt like an eternity, the footsteps stopped. Silence. I scanned the tree line again before heading back inside, my nerves on edge. The radio crackled again, but I ignored it, too focused on listening for any more sounds. For the next hour, I paced the floor, checking the windows, looking for any sign of movement. But nothing. Maybe it was just my imagination. Maybe the isolation was finally getting to me after all these years. But as the night wore on, the unease grew. I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone. Around midnight, I heard it again. Footsteps. This time, they were much closer, right at the base of the tower. I rushed to the window, shining my flashlight down. And that's when I saw him. A man dressed in ragged clothes, standing at the foot of the tower, staring up at me. His face was shadowed by the brim of an old, worn-out hat, but I could see enough to know he wasn't here by accident. His posture was too rigid, too purposeful. Hey! I yelled down. You need something? He didn't answer. He just kept staring. Something in the way he stood, so still, so unblinking, sent a chill down my spine. I tightened my grip on the flashlight, my other hand reaching instinctively for the knife. Slowly, I backed away from the window, moving toward the door. The radio crackled again, louder this time. Dispatch, asking for an update. I debated calling it in. But what would I say? Some guys standing at the bottom of my tower, acting strange? They'd think I was losing it. I glanced back out the window. The man was gone. I swallowed hard, my pulse racing as I flicked off the flashlight, plunging the room into darkness. I strained to listen for any sign of him. The wind howled outside, rattling the windows, but other than that, it was quiet. Too quiet. For a while, I stood there, frozen, waiting for something to happen. Then, out of nowhere, there was a loud thump on the stairs. Then another. Someone, or something, was coming up the tower. I rushed to the door, locking it just. As the footsteps reached the top step, I pressed my ear against the wood, listening. There was a pause, and then a soft knock. My heart pounded so loud I was sure whoever was out there could hear it. I gripped the knife, unsure of what to do. If it was just some lost hiker, why wouldn't they say something? Why wouldn't they call for help? Go away, I muttered under my breath, my voice barely audible. Another knock. Louder this time. I backed away from the door, keeping my eyes on it. The knocks turned to bangs, each one more forceful than the last. The door shook in its frame, but it held. I kept backing up until I hit the wall, my mind racing, trying to think of an escape plan. Suddenly, the banging stopped. Silence filled the room once more. I waited, 
holding my breath, listening for any sign of movement. Then, without warning, a voice, deep, raspy, and unsettling, cut through the air. Let me in. I froze, the blood draining from my face. The voice was calm, almost polite, but there was something off about it. Something menacing. Who are you? I called out, my voice shaky. No answer. Just more silence. I stayed like that for hours, knife in hand, waiting for the man to make his move. But he never did. Eventually, the first light of dawn crept through the windows, and the banging stopped for good. Cautiously, I unlocked the door and stepped outside, the early morning air cool against my skin. I scanned the area, but there was no sign of the man. No footprints, no disturbed ground. Nothing to suggest anyone had been there at all. But I knew what I saw. I knew what I heard. For the next few days, I stayed on high alert, barely sleeping, constantly checking the tree line for any sign of him. But he never came back. Dispatch called in every morning for a check-in, and I gave them the usual report, no fires, no smoke. Everything's quiet. But I didn't mention the man. I didn't think they'd believe me. It's been months now since that night, and I still don't have an explanation for what happened. Was he a drifter? Someone passing through the mountains? Or was it something worse? Something I don't even want to think about? All I know is that I haven't gone back to Calhoun Lookout since. I transferred to another station, closer to the main road closer to people. And I don't plan on returning anytime soon. I never wanted to be a fire lookout, but here I am, sitting alone in a wooden tower deep in the woods, miles away from civilization. The year was 1986, and after everything went sideways in my life, a divorce, losing my job at the factory, and drinking away most of my savings, this gig seemed like an escape from the world. And it was. Until it wasn't. The towers perched high in the hills of Northern California, far enough from town that you couldn't hear or see anyone for miles. Perfect for someone looking to get away from it all, or at least that's what I thought when I signed up for this. Just me, the trees, and my little radio that crackled in once a day from the ranger station. The isolation didn't bother me at first. Hell, it was peaceful. A guy like me, who'd burned every bridge back home, could use some solitude. But it's funny how quickly peace can turn into something else entirely. There was this strange local folklore the rangers told me when I first got here. They joked about it mostly, something about an old mountain legend, some creature or spirit that roamed the forests at night. I didn't pay much attention. They were probably just trying to mess with the new guy, get in my head since I was going to be out here alone. But after a month or two, I started to think maybe they weren't joking. The first sign was subtle. I'd wake up in the middle of the night, heart pounding for no reason, convinced I'd heard something outside the tower. It was like someone, or something, was right below, watching me. I'd tell myself it was just the wind in the trees, an animal passing through. But then, I found tracks. Big ones. Not bear tracks either. I'd seen enough bears growing up to know the difference. These looked almost human, but larger, with long, clawed toes. I took a picture of the tracks, sent it over to the ranger station when they did their weekly supply run. They laughed it off, said it was probably a hoax or maybe I'd misread what I saw. But I knew better. One night, I woke up to a scream, loud, piercing, human, but distorted in a way that sent chills through my entire body. I scrambled out of bed, grabbed the flashlight, and shone it out the window, sweeping it across the trees below. Nothing. Just swaying branches and the distant echo of the scream fading into the night. The next morning, I radioed in what I'd heard, 
but they brushed it off again. Probably a coyote, they said. They make some weird noises at night. But it wasn't a damn coyote, I was sure of it. I grew up hearing those things back in Oregon, and they never sounded like that. This was different. It was primal. A few days later, things got worse. I went out for my usual hike, just to stretch my legs and check on the perimeter of the area I was supposed to keep an eye on. The forest felt wrong that day. Normally, it was full of life, the chirping of birds, the rustling of leaves. But that day, it was dead silent. Not even the wind seemed to move through the trees. I was about two miles from the tower when I found it, a shredded tent, torn apart like something, or someone, had ripped right through it with unimaginable force. There was blood, a lot of it, staining the leaves and the dirt. But there was no body. I radioed in the discovery, my voice shaking, telling them I'd found what looked like a campsite, but it didn't end well for whoever had been there. They sent a team out to investigate, but by the time they arrived, the site was cleared, nothing left but some scraps of fabric and a few bloodstains. They looked at me like I'd lost it, like I was imagining things. But I knew what I saw. And more than that, I knew there was something out there, watching me, waiting for its next move. That night, I stayed up late, sitting in the corner of the tower, shotgun across my lap. The forest was still again, too still. Around 2 a.m., the radio crackled to life, static, followed by faint voices, though I couldn't make out what they were saying. I leaned in, trying to catch a word or two, but then it cut out. Just dead air. Then I heard footsteps below the tower. Heavy, deliberate. I froze, gripping the shotgun tighter, straining to hear. They circled the tower. Slow, methodical, as if they knew I was up there watching. The light from the moon cast long shadows across the clearing, and for a split second, I saw it, a figure, tall, hunched, moving with an unnatural gait. I only caught a glimpse before it disappeared into the trees, but that was enough. It wasn't human. The next morning, I found another set of tracks at the base of the tower, leading off into the woods. They were deeper this time, more defined. I grabbed my camera again, took pictures, but I knew no one would believe me. The rangers thought I was just getting stir-crazy from being alone too long. But I knew better. I could feel it, whatever this thing was, it was getting closer. Boulder. A week passed without any further incident, and I started to let my guard down. Maybe I'd scared it off. Maybe it wasn't as interested in me as I thought. But that was wishful thinking. It was a Thursday night when everything came to a head. I was sitting by the fire, reading an old paperback when I heard the scream again. This time it was closer, much closer. I jumped to my feet, ran to the window, and that's when I saw the light from another fire out in the woods. I hadn't seen any campers come through in days, so whoever it was, they weren't supposed to be there. Grabbing my flashlight and the shotgun, I headed out, against my better judgment, towards the light. The closer I got, the more I realized something was wrong. The fire was too small, too controlled. And there was no movement around it. No sound except for the crackling of the flames. As I approached the clearing, my heart raced. There, on the ground, were two bodies. Or what was left of them. They were mutilated beyond recognition, torn apart in a way that no animal could have done. Then I saw it. Standing at the edge of the firelight, watching me. It was tall, easily eight feet, with long, gangly limbs and skin that seemed to shimmer in the light of the fire. Its face was twisted, almost human, but with elongated features that made my stomach turn. It didn't move, just stood there, staring at me with eyes that seemed too large for its head. For a moment, neither of us moved. Then, without warning, it bolted into the woods, 
disappearing as quickly as it had appeared. My legs felt like jelly as I stumbled back to the tower, locking myself inside and waiting for the sun to rise. The rangers didn't believe me when I told them what I saw, but I didn't care. I knew what I'd seen. And the proof was there, in the photos of the tracks, in the blood-stained earth, in the bodies. They tried to cover it up, said it was a bear attack, said I was hallucinating from too much time alone. But I know better. I'm not the only one out here anymore. And whatever it is, it's still out there. I've been working the fire lookout tower for nearly five years now. It's not the most glamorous job, but it's peaceful, and I'm okay with that. The view from the Appalachian Mountains, especially in autumn, is unmatched. You can see miles of golden and red forests stretching out beneath you like a painting, the kind that makes you forget, just for a moment, how isolated you are. I'd say that isolation is the best and worst part of the job. They tell you, when you sign up for this gig, that strange things happen in the woods. You hear stories from other rangers, stories passed down from the old-timers who have spent their lives working in these forests. They talk about people who went missing and were never found, about strange lights in the sky, eerie sounds that don't belong to any animal. Most of the time, it's just folklore, something to spook the rookies. But I never really paid attention to the tales until this past October. It started like any other shift. The fire season was winding down, but with a dry summer, we were still on high alert. I was stationed at the lookout near Big Bald Mountain. There wasn't much around except for endless trees, wildlife, and the occasional hiker. The first few days of my week long rotation were uneventful, peaceful even. But on the third night, something changed. I was sitting at the desk, checking the weather updates, when I heard it, a faint, low hum, almost like machinery, but distant. I brushed it off, thinking maybe a plane was passing far overhead, though it didn't sound quite right for that. The noise stopped after a few minutes, so I put it out of my mind and went back to my usual routine, monitoring the forest, scanning for smoke plumes logging observations. But it wasn't long before I heard the hum again, this time a little louder. I stepped outside onto the catwalk, the crisp night air biting at my skin. The full moon lit up the forest below, casting long shadows between the trees. I listened for the hum, but now all I could hear was the wind rustling through the branches. Strange, I thought, but nothing to worry about. After all, the woods make all kinds of sounds at night. I went back inside, made a note of the strange noise in my logbook, and headed to bed. The next morning, things seemed normal again. I brewed a pot of coffee, did my morning check of the forest, and radioed into the ranger station. Nothing out of the ordinary. But around noon, I noticed something unusual. Far out in the distance, at the edge of the horizon, there was a faint wisp of smoke. It was almost impossible to see unless you knew what to look for, but it was there. I grabbed the binoculars and peered through them, adjusting the focus. The smoke was thin, as if from a small campfire, but it was coming from a part of the forest that wasn't on any of the hiking trails. I radioed it in, letting the station know what I was seeing, but they didn't seem too concerned probably just some campers off the beaten path, they said. We'll send someone out to check it tomorrow. That's the thing about working in these mountains, tomorrow can mean the difference between a small fire and a disaster, but I didn't argue. Instead, I kept an eye on the smoke for the rest of the day, watching as it slowly dissipated into the air. The following night, the hum returned. Only this time, it wasn't faint. It was loud, and it seemed to come from everywhere at once, vibrating through the floorboards of the tower. I stood up, my heart racing, and stepped outside again. The forest below was bathed in silver light, the moon hanging low in the sky. 
the hum grew louder, almost unbearable, like something was coming closer. Then, just as quickly as it started, it stopped. That's when I saw it. Far off in the distance, near the spot where I'd seen the smoke earlier that day, something moved through the trees. It was hard to make out, but it looked like a person. They were walking slowly, almost limping, and I could just make out the outline of their body in the moonlight. I grabbed my binoculars and focused in on them. It wasn't a hiker. This person, or whatever it was, was tall, unnaturally so, and their limbs seemed too long for their body. My pulse quickened as I watched them move through the trees with an unnatural grace, like they weren't walking at all, more like gliding. I radioed the station immediately. There's someone in the forest, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. They're not on any trails. It doesn't look right. The response came crackling through the speaker. Stay where you are. We'll send someone up first thing in the morning. Do not engage. Do not engage? I thought. I wasn't about to go running into the woods at night after whatever that thing was. I kept watching, but after a few minutes, the figure disappeared into the tree line. For the rest of the night, I barely slept. The hum didn't return, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me. The next morning, the ranger station called me back. We've got a couple of guys heading your way to check out the area where you saw the smoke and the person. Should be there by noon. Noon came and went, and there was no sign of the rangers. By early afternoon, I tried radioing them, but all I got was static. I figured maybe they were just out of range or the terrain was interfering with the signal, but by dusk, I still hadn't heard from them. That's when I saw the smoke again, thicker this time, rising from the same spot as before. I grabbed the binoculars, and my stomach dropped. There, at the base of the smoke, were two figures now. One was the tall, lanky figure from the night before. The other, was on the ground. It didn't move. Panic surged through me. I tried the radio again, but nothing. I was alone, miles from the nearest town, and something was terribly wrong. The hum returned, louder than ever, vibrating through the entire tower. I could feel it in my bones. I grabbed the rifle we kept in the tower for emergencies and pointed it toward the figures. My hands shook as I peered through the scope. The tall figure was bending over the one on the ground, and I could see now that it wasn't a person at all. Its face was elongated, its skin pale and stretched tight over its skull. It had no eyes, just dark, empty sockets that seemed to stare directly at me. I fired a shot. The sound echoed through the mountains, but the creature didn't even flinch. It straightened up slowly, then turned and began moving toward the tower. It was fast, faster than anything I'd ever seen, and before I knew it, it had reached the edge of the forest below me. My heart pounded in my chest as I fired another shot. This time, it stopped, tilting its head to one side as if it was listening. Then, without warning, it let out a sound, a screech so loud and piercing that I dropped the rifle, clutching my ears. When I looked up again, it was gone. I didn't sleep that night. I sat in the tower, rifle in hand, waiting for it to come back, but it never did. The next morning, the rangers arrived. I told them everything, about the smoke, the figure, the body I saw, but when we went to check the area, there was nothing. No smoke, no bodies, no sign that anyone had ever been there. They chalked it up to exhaustion, said maybe I'd been seeing things after a long night. But I know what I saw. The hum, the figure, the body, they were real. And whatever that thing was, it's still out there, somewhere in the forest, waiting. That was the last time I worked the fire lookout. I quit the job the next day. Sometimes I think about going back, just to prove to myself that it was all in my head. 
But deep down, I know the truth. The woods are alive with things we can't understand, things we aren't meant to see. And once you've seen them, you can never go back. There's no romanticizing this job, really. I spend most of my time sitting in a tower, scanning the endless stretch of forest. I'm just a fire lookout, stationed in some forgotten corner of Arizona, near the Kaibab National Forest. Honestly, I took this gig because I needed to get away from everything. Bills piling up, a messy breakup, and all the noise that came with city life. Out here, it's quiet. Almost too quiet sometimes, but I've learned to live with it. They assigned me to Tower 19, one of the older ones, practically falling apart but still standing tall enough to see miles around. My days are all the same. Morning coffee, climb the tower, skin for smoke, read a little, write down whatever I see. And most of the time, there's nothing. No fires, no hikers, no signs of life. Just trees, mountains, and the occasional distant deer or elk. I guess that's why the isolation doesn't bother me. I didn't come here expecting excitement. I'm Martin, by the way. Thirty-something, lost in the woods, quite literally. I'm not a recluse by nature, but I was getting there. This was supposed to be a temporary reset, a chance to clear my head and maybe figure out what to do next. What I didn't expect was that this job would be the site of something I still can't fully wrap my head around. It was 1985, and back then, the area wasn't as regulated as it is today. People wandered off into the forest without maps or proper gear all the time. Most of the time, they came back with stories of getting lost or bitten by a snake. Sometimes they didn't come back at all. The first time I noticed something odd, it was a week after I started the job. The sun was setting, casting long shadows across the forest floor. I was just about to head down the ladder when I saw movement near the base of a nearby hill, maybe a mile off. It was faint, but it looked like a person. My binoculars were always within reach, so I grabbed them, expecting to see a hiker. Instead, I saw a woman, she was running. Not like someone on a casual jog, though. She was sprinting, full speed, her arms flailing wildly as if she was being chased. I radioed it in, but the signal was weak out here. I managed to get through to base and reported a potential missing person or someone in distress. They told me they'd send someone to check it out but with the nearest ranger station being over an hour away, I wasn't sure they'd get here in time. I kept watching, but soon she disappeared into the trees. I stayed up all night, looking out for any signs of light or movement, but the forest swallowed her whole. Two days later, a search team arrived, combing through the woods where I'd last seen her. They found nothing, no tracks, no torn clothes, no signs that anyone had been there but I know what I saw. That image stuck with me, though I tried to brush it off. Maybe she was just a lost hiker who found her way out. I wanted to believe that. Then, a few weeks later, I started hearing the screams. Not the kind that echo from far away, but those faint, distant cries that make you question whether they're real or just your mind playing tricks. I'd be lying in my bunk, dead silent, when I'd hear it, someone calling for help. At first, I thought it was an animal. Bobcats make weird sounds sometimes, but this was different. It sounded human. I'd go out, skim the woods, but there was nothing. The forest was still. No wind, no rustling, just that eerie, suffocating silence. The ranger station assured me it was probably just wildlife but I could hear it in their voices, they didn't believe me. They chalked it up to me being new and getting spooked by the isolation. And maybe I would have let it go if things hadn't gotten worse. One night, around midnight, I heard something banging on the door of the tower. Not a knock, 
but more like a desperate pounding. I jumped up, grabbed the flashlight, and shone it through the window. Nothing. Just the trees swaying gently in the breeze. The pounding continued, louder, more insistent. My heart was in my throat by then. I hadn't seen anyone for days, and the idea that someone was down there, demanding to be let in, didn't sit right. I slowly descended the stairs, one step at a time, my flashlight cutting through the dark. I could hear my own breathing, shaky and uneven. When I reached the bottom, there was no one. But the door was wide open. I knew I'd locked it. There's no way I'd leave it open at night. That's when I noticed the footprints. They were small, barefoot, leading away from the tower into the woods. I couldn't make sense of it. No one would be out here without shoes, not with the rough terrain and sharp rocks. The tracks vanished after about twenty yards, like they'd been erased. I stayed up all night after that, watching, waiting for something else to happen. The following morning, I went out to investigate, more out of frustration than anything else. The footprints had faded, but I found something else, claw marks, deep and jagged, on the trees around the base of the tower. Not bear claws, something else, something that didn't make sense. I reported it to the ranger station, but they didn't send anyone this time. A week later, a hiker went missing. A man named Joe, according to the report. He'd been out with some friends, wandered off to relieve himself, and never came back. They found his backpack, but not him. The search parties went out again, combing through every inch of the forest near the tower. They found nothing. Two days after the search was called off, I saw him. Joe, standing at the edge of the forest, just at the tree line. His clothes were torn, his face pale, eyes wide and staring. But there was something off about him. His movements were jerky, unnatural, like he was being controlled. I called out to him, but he didn't respond. He just stood there, staring at me. And then he turned and walked back into the woods. I ran after him, shouting his name, but when I got to where he'd been, he was gone. Just like the woman. Gone without a trace. I didn't report seeing him. By then, I knew they wouldn't believe me. I didn't even believe me. But I knew what I saw. After that, things started happening fast. More people went missing. Two teenagers camping near the lake, an older couple hiking the trails. Each time, I saw them afterward, standing just at the edge of the forest, watching. They never moved, never spoke, just stood there until I blinked, and they were gone. I stopped sleeping. Every noise made my skin crawl. Every shadow felt like it was moving. I knew something was out there, something that wasn't human. It was using the missing people somehow, making them appear, like some kind of sick game. Then one night, I heard it again, the banging on the door. But this time, it wasn't just banging. It was accompanied by scratching, deep and desperate. I grabbed my rifle, pointed it at the door, and waited. The noise continued, louder, more frantic. I shouted, demanded whoever it was to leave and then the door flew open. Standing in the doorway was Joe, or what was left of him. His skin was gray, his eyes hollow, and his mouth hung open in a silent scream. Behind him, I could see the others, the woman, the teenagers, the old couple, all of them standing there, just staring at me. I fired. Not at them, but into the ground, hoping to scare them off. But they didn't move. They didn't react at all. That's when I saw it. Just behind them, in the shadows, something else moved. Taller than a man, hunched over, its eyes glowing in the darkness. It wasn't human. It couldn't be. And then, just as quickly as they'd appeared, they were gone. All of them. The door slammed shut, 
and I was alone again. I reported everything to the rangers the next day, but they didn't believe me. How could they? No one else had seen what I'd seen. No one else had heard the screams, seen the footprints, or watched the dead walk. I don't know what's out there in those woods, but I know it's real. And it's not done yet. I was stationed at the lookout tower deep in the heart of the Appalachians. It was 1997, and this had been my post for the last four months. I'd been a fire lookout for nearly a decade, living alone in that tower, scanning the tree-covered slopes for any signs of smoke or fire. Most days, it was quiet, just me and the radio, an old transistor humming in the corner, providing occasional contact with the outside world. I liked it that way, simple, isolated. The world couldn't bother me up here. Or at least, I thought it couldn't. The lookout tower was perched on a ridge, high enough to offer a clear view for miles, but low enough to be surrounded by dense forests. It was peaceful, and the daily rhythm of scanning the horizon became meditative over time. But something had been off in the past couple of weeks. There had been reports of hikers going missing, two men, a couple of women, all seemingly vanishing without a trace. I'd caught wind of it from a ranger friend, Dale, who was uneasy about the whole situation. I don't know, man, he'd said over the radio, his voice crackling. The search teams haven't found the thing. No sign of a struggle, no gear left behind, nothing. It's like they just walked off the trail and disappeared. It wasn't unheard of, hikers getting lost. The mountains were deceptive, and once you got turned around, it could take days for anyone to find you. But the total lack of any clues? That bothered me. One evening, as the sun dipped low, casting long shadows through the forest, I saw something that stuck with me. There was movement in the trees, far off in the distance, at the edge of the tree line. At first, I thought it was an animal, maybe a bear or a deer. But as I adjusted the binoculars, I realized it was a person. A man, stumbling through the brush. He seemed disoriented, weaving between the trees, his clothes torn. Something about the way he moved made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I radioed it in, reporting the sighting to Dale. Could be one of the missing hikers, I said, my voice steady despite the unease creeping into my gut. He's about a mile north of my position. Looks like he's hurt. I'll send a team, Dale replied, though he sounded just as uncertain as I felt. I kept watching the man, tracking his movements as best as I could until he disappeared into a particularly dense patch of forest. I kept expecting him to re-emerge on the other side, but he never did. The search team arrived the next morning. They combed through the area where I'd last seen the man, but they found nothing. No tracks, no clothing, no signs of anyone having passed through at all. It was as if the forest had swallowed him whole. That night, as I sat in the tower, staring out at the now pitch black wilderness, I felt something I hadn't felt in years. Fear. The kind that gnaws at you, creeping into the back of your mind when you're alone, making every creak of the wind sound like a threat. Over the next few days, things got stranger. More hikers went missing, and each time it happened, there was never any trace left behind. The forest grew quieter, as though it was holding its breath. And then, I started hearing things at night. It began with small noises, branches snapping, distant footsteps. At first, I chalked it up to animals, but the sounds got closer, more deliberate. One night, I woke up to the unmistakable creak of footsteps right below the tower. I scrambled out of bed, grabbing my flashlight and sweeping the beam down at the base of the lookout. No one was there. But the next morning, I found something that chilled me to the bone. Just a few feet from the base of the tower, embedded in the dirt, were footprints. Human footprints. 
but they didn't look right, too long, too thin, and uneven, as though whoever made them was limping or dragging one foot behind the other. I reported it to Dale, and though he tried to reassure me, I could hear the doubt in his voice. Could be some kids messing around, he said. Maybe some drunk hikers. But we both knew there hadn't been any hikers in the area in days. Not since the disappearances. The next week, things escalated. I was on the evening shift, the forest bathed in the dim glow of twilight. That's when I saw her, a woman this time, staggering through the trees, her clothes filthy, her skin pale as a ghost. She was too far away for me to make out any details, but the way she moved reminded me of the man from before. Stumbling, erratic. Like she didn't quite know where she was going or how she'd gotten there. I radioed it in immediately. Dale, I've got another one, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. She's about half a mile northeast of the tower. I'm going down to check it out. I don't know if that's a good idea, Dale replied, the hesitation clear. Wait for backup. But I was already on my way down the ladder. Something about the way she moved felt different this time. Urgent, almost like she was running from something. I grabbed my flashlight and set off toward the spot where I'd seen her. The forest was dark by the time I got there, the undergrowth thick and oppressive. Every snap of a twig seemed magnified in the stillness. I called out for her, but the only response was the rustling of leaves in the wind. And then, I saw it, just ahead, hanging from a low branch, was a piece of fabric. Torn, dirty, and unmistakably part of the woman's shirt. I moved toward it, my heart pounding in my chest, and that's when I heard the sound behind me. A low, dragging shuffle coming closer. I spun around, flashlight cutting through the dark, but there was nothing. Only the trees, silent and foreboding. My breath caught in my throat as I strained to listen, but the sound had stopped. I backed away slowly, my instinct screaming at me to get out of there. As I did, I caught sight of something in the dirt. Footprints. The same uneven, dragging ones I'd seen by the tower. I ran. By the time I made it back to the tower, I was drenched in sweat, my pulse racing. I radioed Dale again, telling him everything I'd seen. He promised to send a team out first thing in the morning, but I could tell he didn't believe me. Not fully. That night, I barely slept. Every creak of the tower, every gust of wind against the windows, made me jump. I kept expecting to hear that dragging shuffle again, or worse, to see those strange footprints circling the tower. The search team came the next day, but once again, they found nothing. No woman, no tracks, no signs of anything unusual. They looked at me with that same skeptical expression, the one that said they thought I was losing it. Maybe I was. But I knew what I'd seen and I wasn't the only one. Over the next few weeks, more reports came in, other rangers seeing figures in the woods, strange noises at night, even more disappearances. The official story was that it was just a bad season for hikers getting lost, but those of us who worked in the mountains knew better. Something was out there. Something that wasn't human. It was Dale who disappeared next. I hadn't heard from him in a few days, which wasn't unusual, but then his radio went silent completely. A search team was sent out, combing the area where he'd last been stationed. They found his truck, parked on the side of the road, keys still in the ignition. But Dale was gone. No footprints, no sign of a struggle. Just, gone. The tower felt more isolated than ever after that. I stayed up most nights, scanning the tree line, waiting for something to happen. I wasn't sure what I'd do if I saw one of them again, those figures in the woods. But I knew one thing for sure. They were getting closer.
It was July 1996, and I was two weeks into my shift at the Fire Lookout Tower in northern Montana. Our tower was isolated, miles from the nearest town, surrounded by dense forests and mountain ranges that stretched beyond the horizon. At the time, the heat was oppressive, the kind of heat that made you feel like the very air you were breathing was cooking you from the inside. And the isolation only added to the tension. My name is Roy Dempsey, and I've been working as a fire lookout for over a decade. The job was usually calm, but this season, the conditions were perfect for fires, dry, hot, and unpredictable. I'd seen small brush fires from the tower before, but this summer was different. There was a quietness in the air, a kind of silent expectation, like the mountains were holding their breath. The job itself was simple, watch for signs of smoke or fire, report them, and sometimes, if a fire started nearby, evacuate quickly. That last part, though, was rare. I'd only been forced to leave once, back in 1987, and that was a small fire, contained in a day. But this time, I had a bad feeling in my gut. A few days before, there had been distant lightning strikes on the ridge to the west, and though I hadn't seen smoke, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was coming. The isolation always played tricks on the mind. Long hours of nothing but trees, mountains, and sky, with only a radio for company, could drive anyone a little crazy. But I liked it that way. No one bothered me, and I didn't bother anyone. The only people I talked to were the guys down at base camp, and that was only for updates. I preferred the company of the wilderness, the birds, the occasional bear, and the ever-present wind that seemed to whisper stories of the forest's long memory. One evening, as I sat on the porch of the lookout, sipping coffee, I noticed the wind had picked up. The clouds were rolling in, thick and heavy with the promise of a storm. But what made my heart race wasn't the approaching storm, it was the smell. Faint at first, but unmistakable. Smoke. I scrambled to the telescope and scanned the horizon, my eyes tracing the tree line for any signs of a blaze. At first, nothing. But then, there it was, a thin plume of smoke, barely visible against the dusky sky, curling up from the ridge I had been watching for days. I radioed it in immediately. Base, this is Roy at Tower 5. I've got smoke on the western ridge. Looks about eight miles out. Over. There was a long pause before I heard the crackle of the base commander's voice. Copy that, Roy. We're sending a crew to check it out. Any other signs? Negative. Just the smoke for now but it looks like it's spreading. Understood. Stay put and monitor the situation. We'll update you. I set the radio down and grabbed my binoculars, keeping my focus on the ridge. For the next few hours, I watched as the smoke thickened, becoming darker and more menacing. The wind was no longer a gentle breeze, it had turned into a gusting force that whipped through the trees, pushing the smoke eastward toward my tower. By midnight, I could see the orange glow of flames licking the treetops in the distance. It was small, but growing. I checked the radio again, hoping for an update, but there was only static. My hands trembled as I adjusted the frequency, trying to get through to base camp. Nothing. The storm had moved in, and the lightning was flashing across the sky like nature's own firework display. Thunder boomed in the distance, echoing through the valleys. The fire had doubled in size by morning. I could see the smoke billowing, thick and black, rising higher into the sky. The radio finally crackled to life. Roy, this is base. The crew is reporting a fire on the western ridge. They're working on containment, but the wind is making it difficult. You may need to evacuate if it gets closer. Understood, I replied, though my gut told me there was no containing this one. The wind was too strong, 
and the fire was feeding on the dry underbrush like a hungry beast. I packed my essentials, maps, a canteen, some food, and kept the radio close. By noon, the fire had spread across the ridge and was heading downhill, moving faster than I had ever seen. Flames stretched as high as the treetops, consuming everything in their path. The heat was so intense that even from miles away, I could feel it on my face. I had never seen anything like it. Base radioed again. Roy, we're advising immediate evacuation. The fire is out of control, and we can't risk it reaching the tower. I hear you, I said, but something in me hesitated. This was my post. I had seen fires before, and they always looked worse from afar. But as I looked through the binoculars again, my heart sank. The fire wasn't just a distant threat anymore, it was coming for me. I grabbed my gear and left the tower. There was an old service trail that led down the mountain and connected to the main road. It would take a couple of hours on foot, but I had no choice. I radioed base to let them know I was heading out, and they confirmed they'd have a vehicle waiting at the road. The air was thick with smoke as I started down the trail. The wind had shifted again, pushing the fire toward the valley. I moved quickly but the trail was narrow and overgrown in places, slowing me down. Every now and then, I'd glance back and see the fire inching closer, devouring the trees in its path. About halfway down, I heard a sound that stopped me in my tracks, a low rumble, deep and distant at first, but growing louder. At first, I thought it was thunder, but it was too continuous, too constant. Then it hit me, a landslide. The fire had weakened the trees and loosened the soil on the ridge. Now, with the wind and the flames tearing through the forest, the earth was giving way. I could hear the crash of trees and rocks tumbling down the mountainside, and my heart raced as I scanned the area for cover. There was a small outcropping of rock just off the trail, and I sprinted toward it, ducking beneath the ledge just as the landslide roared past. Trees snapped like toothpicks and boulders the size of cars crashed down the slope, tearing through the underbrush. The noise was deafening, and the ground shook beneath me. When it was over, I climbed out from under the ledge and surveyed the damage. The trail was gone, buried under debris. The fire was still coming, and now I was trapped. I radioed Base again, my voice shaking. Base, this is Roy. I'm stuck on the trail. Landslide took out the path. Over. There was a pause before they responded. Roy, we're sending a chopper to your location. Hang tight. It's going to be close. I had no choice but to wait. The fire was closing in, the heat growing more intense with each passing minute. I could hear the crackle of flames, the pop of burning wood. The smoke was thick, choking. My eyes watered, and my throat burned. I could feel the fire's breath on my skin. Minutes felt like hours. Then, through the haze, I heard the unmistakable sound of helicopter blades slicing through the air. I waved frantically as the chopper appeared above the treetops, hovering over the valley. A rope ladder dropped down, and I grabbed hold, climbing as fast as I could. The heat was unbearable and I could feel the flames licking at my boots as I ascended. When I reached the top, I collapsed into the helicopter, gasping for air. The pilot gave me a thumbs up, and we rose higher, leaving the inferno behind. As we flew away, I looked down at the mountain, now engulfed in flames. The tower was gone, swallowed by the fire, and the forest I had called home for years was nothing but ash. The fire burned for days, spreading across the region, destroying everything in its path. The official report would later call it one of the worst wildfires in Montana's history. Dozens of homes were lost, and two firefighters didn't make it out. Their bodies were found in the aftermath, charred beyond recognition. We never figured out how the fire started, 
whether it was the lightning or something else, but in the end, it didn't matter. The fire had done its damage. And I had survived, just barely. I had always been drawn to the solitude of the forest. Something about being alone, high above the trees in my fire lookout tower, made me feel secure in a way that nothing else did. I suppose that's why I took the job in the first place. It was the late 1990s, a time when the Appalachian Mountains were still a vast, untamed wilderness. Sure, people came through, hikers, campers, but the deeper sections of the forest felt untouched, as though the earth itself hadn't yet been fully discovered. My station was remote. Really remote. I had to hike two days to get in and out, which suited me fine. The tower stood on a rocky outcrop with sweeping views of the ridges, valleys, and endless stretches of green below. It was peaceful, the kind of place where time moves slower and the wind whispers in a language only nature can understand. That summer, something felt off, though. At first, I thought it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Days stretched into weeks, the sun rising and falling, and I started to get this creeping feeling that I wasn't alone. It was nothing concrete, just a sensation, like someone was watching from the trees. I'd scan the forest through the binoculars, but nothing ever moved. Not at first. The weirdness began subtly, with small things disappearing. One day, the box of matches I always kept on my desk was gone. Then my canteen went missing. I found it two days later, half buried in the dirt at the base of the tower. No big deal, I told myself. Maybe a raccoon or a curious hiker wandered by when I wasn't paying attention. But then, there were the footsteps. I was sitting up in the tower late one evening, watching the sun drop below the horizon. The air was still, the kind of heavy calm that presses down before a storm. That's when I heard them. Clear as day, footsteps crunching through the underbrush, circling the base of the tower. I shot up and leaned over the railing, peering down into the fading light. The trees cast long shadows across the clearing, but I couldn't see anyone. The sound stopped, replaced by the deafening silence of the woods. After a few minutes of nothing, I convinced myself it was probably an animal. It couldn't be a person, nobody would be out here this late, right? The next morning, I found the footprints. They weren't animal tracks, but they weren't quite human either. Long, narrow depressions in the dirt, with a strange unevenness to them, like the creature that left them didn't walk like you or me. I crouched down to inspect them, feeling an icy knot tighten in my gut. Something wasn't right. These weren't made by any animal I'd ever seen. Over the next few nights, the sounds returned. Always just after dark. The crunching of footsteps, the occasional snap of a twig. I'd rush to the edge of the tower, searching the ground below, but there was never anyone there. The footprints multiplied, more of them scattered around the tower. They seemed to get closer each night, edging nearer to the ladder. I tried radioing into the ranger station, but all I got was static. Sometimes I could hear faint voices breaking through the interference, but nothing clear enough to understand. I was cut off. That's when the first hiker went missing. I wasn't aware at first. Days had passed, and no one had come through the area. But I found a discarded backpack one morning, lying at the base of the tower. It hadn't been there the night before. The pack was torn, as if it had been ripped apart by something with claws. The contents were scattered across the ground, clothing, a water bottle, a folded map. No sign of the hiker. A few days later, I heard the helicopters. Rescue teams were combing the mountains, searching for a missing man. The radio reports said he was an experienced hiker, someone who knew these trails well. Yet they found nothing. No sign of a struggle, no remains, no camp. 
just the wilderness swallowing him whole. By this time, I had barricaded myself inside the lookout at night. The footsteps around the tower had grown louder, more deliberate. I could hear them pacing, circling, moving closer. I stopped sleeping altogether, spending my nights staring out into the pitch-black forest, my hands trembling on the rifle I kept by the door. And then, one night, it came. I was half-dozing in the chair, the low hum of insects outside lulling me into a fitful rest. That's when I heard the creak. The sound of something heavy pressing against the metal ladder. My eyes shot open, and I froze, every muscle tensing. Another creak. The ladder groaned under the weight of something climbing. Slowly, I grabbed the rifle and stepped toward the door. The tower swayed slightly in the wind, but that wasn't what was making the ladder creak. Whatever was climbing, it was almost to the top. I could hear its breath now, ragged and wet, like it was struggling to breathe. My heart pounded in my chest as I crept closer to the door. Then, the scraping began. Something was dragging itself up the final few rungs, metal screeching against metal. I stood by the door, rifle raised, my hands shaking so hard I thought I'd drop the gun. The scraping stopped. For a long, agonizing moment, there was nothing but silence. Suddenly, a loud thud. The sound of something landing on the platform just outside the door. I swallowed hard, forcing myself to breathe slowly. My hand reached for the doorknob, but I didn't dare open it. A low hiss, like air escaping a balloon, came from the other side of the door. It was close, just inches away. I could feel it, whatever it was, waiting. Then, in one swift motion, the door slammed inward, nearly knocking me off my feet. I stumbled backward, raising the rifle and firing wildly into the doorway. The shots echoed in the night, deafening in the confined space. For a moment, there was nothing but smoke and the acrid smell of gunpowder. I stared, my heart hammering in my chest. The door hung crooked on its hinges, but the platform outside was empty. No blood. No body. Whatever had been there was gone. I spent the rest of the night huddled in the corner, rifle in hand, waiting for it to come back. But it never did. The next morning, I found more tracks. They circled the base of the tower, leading off into the dense forest. But they weren't alone this time. A second set of prints joined them, smaller, human prints, side by side with the strange ones. The rescue teams found the hiker three days later. Well, parts of him. His body had been torn apart, scattered across the rocks near a stream. They said it was a bear attack, that he must have wandered too close to a grizzly. But I knew better. The forest had its own rules. And something out there was hunting. I left my post a few days after that. I never told anyone what really happened. The rangers chalked up my request for transfer to stress, isolation, the usual reasons. But I know what I saw, what I heard. Whatever was out there, it wasn't done. And it would come back, waiting for its next prey to venture too deep into the woods. I was stationed at Lookout Peak, a fire tower deep in the Appalachian wilderness, back in the summer of 93. It wasn't a popular job, but the isolation didn't bother me. I actually liked the quiet. Being a fire lookout meant long, uneventful hours staring out over miles of forest, broken only by the occasional radio check-in, and, if you were lucky, a storm or two to spice up the monotony. But that summer, something was off from the start. The first time I noticed anything strange was about two weeks into my shift. The weather had been hot and dry, prime conditions for wildfires, but aside from the usual rustle of the trees and the distant call of birds, there wasn't much to worry about. Until the night came. The nights up there were pitch black, 
with no city lights, no car headlights, just pure, unadulterated darkness. On a clear night, the stars lit up the sky like a blanket of fireflies, but this particular night was cloudy, moonless, and disturbingly quiet. It was around 2 a.m. when I heard it, just a soft rustling, nothing unusual at first. The forest was full of critters, after all. But then the rustling turned to something heavier, like footsteps. Not human footsteps, but not quite an animal either. I strained my ears, leaning over the rail of the tower, peering down into the blackness below, but I couldn't see a thing. The sound circled the base of the tower, slow, deliberate. I flicked on my flashlight and shone it into the dark. The beam barely cut through the heavy night, illuminating only the trees and a patch of ground directly below me. I stood there for a good five minutes, waiting, heart pounding, but whatever it was, if it was anything at all, seemed to have disappeared. The next morning, I chalked it up to my imagination. Lack of sleep, maybe. I didn't mention it when I radioed into the station, and by midday, I had almost convinced myself it was nothing. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something had been watching me. Things escalated two nights later. I was going about my routine, checking the horizon for smoke or any sign of a blaze, when I noticed something peculiar. There was a faint, flickering light deep in the forest, way off to the west. At first, I thought it might be campers, though it was strange, since camping wasn't allowed that deep into the woods without a permit. But the light didn't look like a campfire. It was small, almost like a lantern, and it moved slowly, weaving between the trees. I grabbed my binoculars to get a better look, but by the time I focused in, the light was gone. I kept scanning, waiting for it to reappear, but it didn't. A shiver ran down my spine. I tried to convince myself it was nothing, just a trick of the light or some reflection. But deep down, I knew that light wasn't a figment of my imagination. That same night, the footsteps returned. Heavier this time, more distinct. I grabbed the flashlight again, but this time, I didn't shine it immediately. I just listened. The footsteps were moving faster now, like they were circling the tower, each lap getting quicker. I felt my pulse quicken as a cold sweat broke out on my skin. I knew there weren't any large animals in the area that could move like that, certainly not in a pattern. I called it into the ranger station the next morning, feeling a bit foolish. The dispatcher, Hank, chuckled at me. Come on, man. You're up there in the middle of nowhere. It's easy to start hearing things. Maybe, I said, though I wasn't convinced. But it didn't feel right. He promised to send someone to check the area, but deep down, I knew it wouldn't help. Whatever was out there wasn't something you could just explain away with logic or routine. Over the next few days, the strange occurrences kept piling up. The lantern light appeared almost every night, always flickering, always moving just out of reach. And the footsteps, they never stopped. By then, I was convinced I wasn't alone up there, though I never saw a thing. Just the noises, always at night, always just beyond the reach of my flashlight. Then came the night that changed everything. It was around midnight when I heard the unmistakable sound of an engine approaching. I wasn't expecting anyone, but the sound was coming from the access road, a beaten-down dirt path that only rangers and maintenance crews used. I grabbed my binoculars and scanned the road. Sure enough, I saw headlights cutting through the trees. I felt a strange mix of relief and apprehension. If someone was coming, that meant I wasn't imagining things, right? Maybe it was Hank, or one of the other guys coming to check on me. But as the vehicle drew closer, my stomach sank. It wasn't a ranger truck. It was an old pickup, rusted, with no markings. It stopped at the base of the tower, and I watched as two figures stepped out. I didn't recognize them. 
They weren't rangers, and they certainly didn't look like any kind of official crew. One of them was tall. Lanky, with a wide-brimmed hat that obscured his face. The other was shorter, stockier, carrying what looked like a bag slung over his shoulder. They stood at the base of the tower for a moment, looking up. I called down, Hey! Can I help you? Neither of them responded. The tall one looked up, his face still hidden in shadow, and pointed toward the tower. The shorter one nodded and started walking around the base, disappearing from my line of sight. My heart was pounding now. I grabbed the radio and called Hank. Hey, Hank. You got anyone scheduled to come out here tonight? Nope. Why? There's two guys at the base of my tower. They're not rangers. There was a long pause on the other end before Hank replied, his voice tense. Lock your door. The words sent a chill down my spine. I looked down at the trapdoor that led into the cabin. I hadn't locked it. I rushed over, bolting it shut just as the sound of footsteps echoed up the tower stairs. The metal creaked under their weight, slow, deliberate. I backed away from the trapdoor, grabbing the shotgun we were issued for emergencies. My hands were shaking, but I held it tight, pointing it at the door. For what felt like hours, I stood there, waiting, listening to the footsteps. They stopped just outside the door. The tower was silent. And then, a voice. We just want to talk. It was the tall one. His voice was low, calm, almost soothing, but something about it made my skin crawl. I don't have anything to say, I called back. You sure about that? He asked, his tone almost playful. You've been watching us, haven't you? My blood ran cold. The lantern light. They knew. They had been out there, in the woods, watching me, taunting me. My mind raced. I hadn't told anyone about the light. How did they know? We've been watching you, too, the voice continued. It's been fun, hasn't it? I didn't respond. My finger hovered over the trigger. The footsteps started again, but this time, they were moving away. I heard the creak of the metal stairs as they descended. I waited, holding my breath, until the only sound left was the distant rustle of the wind through the trees. I stayed awake all night, gun in hand, waiting for them to return. But they didn't. The next morning, I radioed Hank again and told him everything. He didn't laugh this time. A team was sent out to investigate, but by the time they arrived, the pickup was gone. They found tracks, but no sign of the men. I stayed at the tower for another week, but nothing happened after that night. No footsteps. No lanterns. It was like they had vanished. Hank offered to cut my shift short, but I refused. Maybe it was pride, or maybe it was stupidity, but I wasn't about to let fear chase me out of there. I never found out who they were or what they wanted. The forest went back to being quiet, the nights calm, but I never shook the feeling that I was being watched. Even after I left the lookout for good, I could still hear those footsteps in my dreams, circling the base of the tower, slow and deliberate, like they were waiting for something. And maybe, just maybe, they still are. I wasn't one for drama, and you could say that's part of the reason I became a fire lookout. Solitude, routine, and the peaceful hum of the wilderness suited me. My station, high in the Cascades, sat about a mile from the nearest road, and I had an old pickup to get me there. The job was simple, watch for fires, report anything suspicious, and keep the station tidy. It wasn't much, but it was a life. One of peace, mostly. The lookout tower was a sturdy, fifty-foot-tall wooden structure with a panoramic view of miles and miles of thick forest and jagged peaks. Summers meant dry, 
Brill Air, the perfect fuel for wildfires. It was the 90s, before cell phones and GPS, so communication was done mostly through radio or a landline that worked on good days. Most shifts, I'd spend hours scanning the horizon with binoculars or checking the weather reports. The region was known for its unpredictable storms. Thunderstorms could creep in fast, and lightning strikes often meant trouble. Even with nothing going on, the tension never left. Every snap of a twig, every gust of wind felt like it could be the start of something bad. I'd been at my post for a little over two years, and nothing ever came close to resembling a catastrophe. But that summer, 1995, something changed. Something I can't fully explain to this day. It started with a radio call. It was mid-August, just after dawn, when I heard the static crackle on the emergency line. I barely noticed at first, half asleep with a mug of coffee in hand. Base to Tower 7. Come in, Tower 7. I picked up the mic and held it close, rubbing the sleep from my eyes. Tower 7, here. Over. We've got a storm rolling through, could be a bad one. Keep an eye out for strikes in Sector 8B. Some of the other towers are getting low readings on the radio. Over. I glanced out the window. The sky was clear, blue as far as I could see. I checked the map. Sector 8B was south of my position, nothing but dense forest and a few old logging roads cutting through it. Quiet as it gets. Copy that, base. I'll keep you posted. Over. I hung up and returned to scanning the forest. The sun was creeping up over the mountains, casting long shadows through the valleys. I wasn't expecting much, maybe a passing thunderhead that would dump some rain and move on. But an hour passed, then two, and the sky remained as clear as it had been all morning. Then, something shifted. It was subtle at first, a flicker of movement in the distant treeline. I squinted thinking it might be a deer or some other wildlife. But there was something off about it. The movement was slow, almost deliberate, like someone was walking through the woods. But I couldn't make out any details. The radio crackled again. Tower 7, come in. Over. Go ahead, base. Over. Weather's moving in faster than we thought. We're picking up some strange signals from your area. You seeing anything? Over. I glanced back out the window, the unease growing in my gut. Something wasn't right, but I couldn't place it. The forest was too still. Nothing unusual yet. I'll keep watching. Over. By mid-afternoon, the first storm clouds had started to gather. The sky had darkened quickly, casting an eerie shadow over the landscape. I could hear the distant rumble of thunder. It was time to get serious. I ran a final check of my equipment, made sure the generator was fueled up, and secured everything in case the wind picked up. I had seen plenty of storms in my time, but this one felt different. The air was thick with electricity, and the forest below seemed unnaturally quiet. Not even a bird call. Then, the lightning came. It was a sudden, violent crack that split the sky in two. A massive bolt hit somewhere in the distance, and I instinctively grabbed my binoculars, scanning the area where I thought it had struck. At first, I couldn't see anything but dark clouds and rain starting to fall. Then I saw it, a column of smoke rising from the forest floor in Sector 8B. Tower 7 to base, come in. Over. Go ahead, Tower 7. Over. Got a possible strike in 8B, seeing smoke. I'm gonna head down to check it out. Over. Copy that. Proceed with caution. Over. I grabbed my gear, fire extinguisher, axe, and the small first aid kit I always kept handy, 
and headed down the narrow staircase. The wind had picked up now, and the rain was coming down in sheets. I hopped in the truck and started driving toward the smoke. The forest road was rough, and the storm made it even worse. My headlights cut through the gloom, revealing trees whipping in the wind and branches littering the ground. I was about two miles in when I saw the flames. They weren't large yet, maybe ten feet high, but they were spreading fast. The strike must have hit a dry patch of brush, and now the fire was licking at the trunks of nearby trees, threatening to explode into something much worse. I grabbed my extinguisher and ran toward the fire, hoping I could contain it before it spread. But as I approached, I noticed something strange. A shape, dark, hunched, moving through the flames. At first, I thought it was an animal, maybe a bear, caught in the fire. But as I got closer, I realized it wasn't an animal. It was a man. He was stumbling through the flames, his clothes scorched, his body hunched over as if he was in pain. Hey! I yelled, waving my arms. Get out of there! He didn't respond. He just kept moving, slowly, methodically, like he was in some kind of trance. I ran toward him, but the heat was too intense. I had to back off, coughing from the smoke. Tower 7 to base, I've got a person down here, in the fire. Over. Static. The radio wasn't working. I tried again, but there was nothing but dead air. The storm must have knocked out the signal. I didn't have a choice. I had to get him out. I ran back to the truck, grabbed a wet blanket from the back, and rushed toward the flames again. The fire was growing now, spreading to the trees around us. I could feel the heat on my face, but I pushed forward, waving the blanket in front of me to shield myself. When I got close enough, I grabbed the man by the arm and pulled him out of the flames. His skin was badly burned, his clothes charred. He collapsed into my arms, barely conscious. Hang on, I muttered, dragging him back toward the truck. It wasn't until I laid him on the ground that I noticed the blood. His shirt was torn, and there was a deep wound in his side, like he'd been stabbed. My heart pounded as I tried to process what I was seeing. This wasn't just some accident. This man had been attacked. I reached for the radio again, but it was still dead. I had to get him to safety. The fire was spreading fast, and the storm was making it impossible to see more than a few feet ahead. I hoisted him into the passenger seat and sped back toward the tower. But as I drove, I couldn't shake the feeling that we weren't alone. Something was out there in the trees. I could feel it. By the time we reached the tower, the man was barely breathing. I laid him on the floor of the cabin and tried the radio again. Base, come in. I've got a man down here, badly injured. I need help. Over. Nothing. I looked down at the man, his face pale and slick with sweat. He opened his eyes for a moment just long enough to whisper something. Don't trust the storm. His words sent a chill down my spine. And then he was gone. I stepped back from his body, my mind racing. What did he mean? Why had he been out there, in the middle of the fire? And who had attacked him? I glanced out the window. The storm was still raging, the fire spreading in the distance but something was moving in the trees. When I took the job as a fire lookout in Idaho, I didn't think it would be the kind of place where you'd meet anyone, let alone something worth remembering. You know, spending months in a tower miles away from civilization, with nothing but an old radio and my trusty pair of binoculars, doesn't sound like the recipe for excitement. It's peaceful. That's what I wanted. I'd been dealing with some heavy stuff, personal demons, 
a divorce, and the kind of debt that weighs on you day in and day out. The mountains were my escape. The year was 1987, and I had no interest in seeing another soul. No one up there to remind me of my problems, no one asking for favors, just me in the wilderness. I'd been there for a few weeks by then, watching the sky and scanning the treetops for smoke, but all was quiet. Too quiet, even for the wilderness. I didn't think much of it at first. That all changed when the first call came in. It was late afternoon, maybe around four o'clock, when I got a report on the radio about a missing hiker. A man named Marvin Wexler hadn't come back from his trek the day before. The park rangers wanted to know if I'd seen anyone wandering off the trails or maybe spotted smoke from a campfire that didn't belong. I hadn't, but it wasn't unusual for people to get lost out here. The Sawtooth Range was full of steep inclines and dense forests, one wrong turn and you could end up miles from where you thought you were. I was told to keep my eyes peeled, and that was the last I heard from them for a few hours. As the sun set and the darkness crept in, I started feeling that odd sensation you get when you know something isn't quite right. I tried to shake it off paranoia from being alone too long. Maybe I was imagining things, but the forest looked different that night. It wasn't just the way the shadows stretched out or the cold wind that made the trees sway. No, it was something else. A stillness that didn't belong. No birds, no rustling, just silence. A little past midnight, the radio crackled to life again. This time, it was worse. They'd found Marvin, but not in the way anyone would want to be found. His body had been discovered by a ranger near Pine Lake, torn to shreds. The guy on the other end of the radio was shaking as he described it, said it looked like an animal had gotten to him. But no animal around here could do that. I mean, we had bears, sure, but they usually left evidence. Tracks, fur, something. All they found were Marvin's torn clothes and pieces of him scattered around the trees. I stayed up that night, rifle by my side, binoculars hanging from my neck as I scanned the tree line, waiting for something to move. I didn't see anything, but I couldn't sleep either. I could feel eyes on me, watching from somewhere out in the dark. The next morning, I called in to check if there were any updates but they didn't know much more. The ranger who found Marvin was gone. Left without a trace in the same area where he made the discovery. His name was Ross Traeger, and now he was missing too. A search party was sent out, but I wasn't involved. They didn't ask me, and I didn't volunteer. I stayed in my tower, watching through my binoculars, waiting for any sign of movement. But days passed, and nothing happened. Until the third night. I remember it was raining hard, the kind of rain that feels like it's trying to drown the forest. Lightning flashed in the distance, lighting up the sky just enough to show the silhouette of something moving through the trees. It was big, much larger than a bear. I grabbed my binoculars and focused, heart pounding in my chest, and that's when I saw it a figure, walking upright but hunched, dragging something behind it. I lost it in the storm, but I knew then that whatever killed Marvin wasn't any animal I'd ever seen. I radioed it in, but they didn't take me seriously. It's hard to blame them. What would you think if some guy told you he saw a giant, human-shaped figure wandering the woods in the middle of a storm? They told me to keep an eye out and let them know if I saw it again. The next few nights were rough. Sleep wasn't coming easy, not with whatever that thing was out there. I didn't hear from the rangers again until a week later. Another person had gone missing, this time a local guy, Gregor Fields, who lived not far from the trailhead. He'd been hunting with his brother when he vanished. His brother swore up and down he saw something take Gregor. He described it almost exactly as I had, tall, human-like, but twisted, deformed, with long arms that seemed to drag on the ground. The rangers dismissed it, said it was probably a bear, 
and maybe the storm had played tricks on their eyes. I didn't buy it. Not for a second. I stayed on high alert, eyes constantly scanning the forest. One night, I decided to venture down. I don't know why, maybe curiosity, maybe stupidity, but I couldn't just sit there anymore. I grabbed my flashlight and rifle and started down the trail that led toward Pine Lake, where they'd found Marvin. The trees loomed over me, the darkness between them thick and impenetrable. My breath was loud in the silence. Every crack of a branch made me jump. When I got to the lake, it was eerily calm. The water was still, reflecting the half-moon above. I scanned the shore with my light half expecting to find another body. I found something worse. At first, it looked like an old campsite, remnants of a fire pit and some scattered debris. But as I got closer, I saw it, a makeshift shrine of bones, human and animal alike, arranged in a sickening pattern. In the center was a skull, not fully human, not fully animal, but something in between. That's when I heard it. Footsteps behind me. Slow deliberate. I turned, rifle raised, but there was nothing there. My heart raced, and I backed up slowly, keeping my eyes on the tree line. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw it again, those long arms, that hunched figure, moving between the trees, watching me. I bolted. I ran faster than I'd ever run in my life, back up the trail, back to my tower, and slammed the door behind me. I don't know how long I sat there, staring out into the darkness, waiting for it to come after me. But it never did. Not that night, anyway. I called it in again, told the rangers what I saw, but they didn't send anyone. Said it was too dangerous at night, and they'd check it out in the morning. I didn't sleep. The next day, they sent a couple of guys up to the lake. They didn't find the shrine, didn't find anything. It was like it had never been there. But I knew what I saw. And I wasn't the only one. A week later, I packed my things and left. I quit. There was no way I was staying out there any longer, not with that thing in the woods. A few more people went missing over the next few months, but they stopped calling me. I moved to the city, far away from the forest, from the mountains. I don't know what it was I saw out there. But I know it's still there, somewhere in those woods, waiting for the next unlucky soul to wander too close. I've been a fire lookout for nearly ten years now. My tower sits on the edge of a dense forest in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, just above the tree line, where the pines thin out and the rocky ridges start to show. It's isolated, quiet, and perfect for someone like me, someone who prefers their own company to the chaos of the world below. That was the case until the summer of 1995, the year when the solitude I had cherished for so long turned into something far darker. It was late July, the time of year when the fire risk was at its highest. The days were long and scorching, and every now and then, dry lightning storms rolled through, lighting the sky like fireworks crackling over the mountains without any rain to cool the forest below. My job was to watch for smoke, report any sign of fire, and stay alert. But that summer, I started noticing things that didn't belong. It began with small, almost unnoticeable signs. In the mornings, I'd find my gear moved around, my binoculars left on the other side of the desk, my notebook open to a different page. At first, I chalked it up to my own absent-mindedness. Living alone up here can mess with your sense of time and space. But after a week, the signs became impossible to ignore. One night, I woke up to the sound of creaking floorboards. It wasn't the wind or the usual groaning of the old wooden tower settling into the mountain. It was deliberate, slow, and purposeful. I grabbed my flashlight and swept the room but there was no one there. I checked the door, it was locked from the inside, just as I had left it before going to bed. Still, I felt a presence, something I couldn't explain. Over the next few days, the feeling of being watched grew stronger. 
I'd scan the forest through my binoculars, my eyes darting between the endless sea of green, but I never saw anything out of the ordinary. No smoke, no sign of life beyond the occasional deer or bird. Yet, every night, I'd wake up to the same sound, footsteps on the floorboards. And every morning, something else would be out of place, my radio unplugged, my maps scattered across the table, a canteen emptied of water. One evening, as the sun set and the sky turned a bruised shade of purple, I decided to hike down the mountain for some fresh air and to clear my head. I hadn't left the tower for days, and the walls were starting to feel like they were closing in. I grabbed my backpack, locked the door, and headed down the trail that wound its way through the forest. The air was thick with the smell of pine and earth, the forest humming with the sounds of insects and the occasional rustle of animals in the underbrush. As I walked, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being followed. I'd stop, turn around, and scan the trees but there was never anything there. Just the silence of the woods, broken only by the wind and the distant call of an owl. About halfway down the trail, I noticed something strange. There, nailed to a tree, was a piece of paper, weathered and yellowing at the edges. I approached it cautiously, my heart pounding in my chest. Written in jagged, uneven letters was a single word, leave. I tore the paper down, my hands shaking. Someone was trying to mess with me, that much was clear. But who? And why? The nearest town was miles away, and the only people who ever came up this far were hikers or the occasional ranger on patrol. None of them had any reason to do something like this. I quickened my pace, the sun dipping lower behind the mountains, casting long shadows across the forest floor. By the time I reached the bottom of the trail, the sky was a deep, inky black. I felt exposed, vulnerable. My mind raced with questions, none of which had answers. When I got back to the tower, I found the door wide open. My stomach dropped. I had locked it, I was sure of that. I stepped inside, every muscle in my body tensed. The place was a mess. My maps were torn from the walls, my radio smashed on the floor. But the worst part was what was scrawled across the window in thick, black marker, you were warned, I didn't sleep that night. I sat in the corner of the room with my back against the wall, a knife in my hand, waiting for something, anything, to happen. But the hours dragged on in silence, the only sound the faint rustling of the wind outside. By morning, I was exhausted but I knew I had to report what had happened. I tried to radio in, but without my equipment, there was no way to contact the ranger station. My only option was to hike down to town and report it in person. I packed a small bag, grabbed what supplies I could, and set off down the trail again, my eyes scanning every tree, every shadow. Halfway down, I found another note. This one wasn't nailed to a tree. It was lying in the middle of the trail, as if someone had been waiting for me to find it. The message was different this time. Instead of a warning, it was a name, Jake Harland. I froze. Jake Harland was a ranger who had disappeared up here two years ago. They had searched for weeks but never found a trace of him. His name was still whispered in the local bars, a mystery that no one could solve. And now, his name was written on a piece of paper, left for me to find. I didn't make it to town that day. I turned back, the name burning in my mind. What did Jake Harland have to do with this? Was he alive? Or was someone using his disappearance to scare me? The questions nodded me, but I had no answers, just a growing sense of dread that I couldn't shake. When I got back to the tower... I found something waiting for me. On the table, where I had left my gear, was an old photograph. It was faded, the edges worn, but I could still make out the faces. There were two people in the photo, a man and a woman, standing in front of a cabin. The man was Jake Harland. The woman, 
I didn't recognize. But it was the cabin that caught my attention. I knew that cabin. It was about a mile west of the tower, abandoned for years. I had passed it dozens of times on my patrols, never giving it a second thought. I knew what I had to do, even though every instinct told me to run the other way. I had to find that cabin. I grabbed my flashlight and headed out, the photograph tucked into my pocket. The trail to the cabin was overgrown, the branches clawing at my arms and face as I pushed my way through. By the time I reached it, the sun had dipped behind the mountains, casting the forest in a deep, eerie twilight. The cabin was just as I remembered, small, dilapidated, and forgotten by time. But as I approached, I noticed something I hadn't seen before. The door was ajar, just a crack, enough for me to see the darkness inside. I stepped closer, my flashlight cutting through the gloom. Inside, the air was thick with the smell of decay. The floorboards creaked under my weight as I stepped inside, my flashlight sweeping the room. It was empty, except for a table in the center, covered in dust and cobwebs. But there, in the middle of the table, was something that stopped me cold. A single word, scratched into the wood with a knife, run, I heard it before I saw it, a low, guttural sound, like the breath of something huge and dangerous. I spun around, my flashlight flickering in the dark, but there was nothing there. Just the silence of the forest pressing in on me, heavy and suffocating. Then, the footsteps started. I always believed that being a fire lookout was the perfect escape from the bustle of the world. It was 1997, and I had been assigned to an old fire tower deep in the Bitterroot Mountains, right on the Montana-Idaho border. The tower was perched on a craggy peak, surrounded by nothing but endless forests. For miles, it was just pines, valleys, and rivers, with the nearest town being a good four-hour drive away. I was there to keep an eye on lightning strikes, campfires, or any sign of a blaze that could turn the forest into an inferno. It was a solitary job, and that suited me just fine. I enjoyed the peace and quiet, waking up every morning to the crisp, thin air and the scent of pine needles. The fire tower was old but sturdy, and it creaked with the wind that often howled through the trees below. I had my routines, radio checks, weather reports, scanning the horizon with my binoculars, and marking coordinates on the map. It was quiet, peaceful work. The days passed slowly, and I didn't mind. But about three weeks into my shift, the weather turned. The summer storms rolled in early that year, and with them came a suffocating, dry heat. I could see the storm clouds building on the horizon, a solid mass of gray and black, angry and threatening. My job was to monitor them, track lightning strikes, and report any potential fires. But I wasn't prepared for what came next. It started in the middle of the night. The wind, which had been a constant companion, began to shift. I woke up to the sound of the shutters banging violently against the tower's walls. I climbed out of bed stumbled to the window, and looked out into the darkness. The sky was a swirling mass of clouds, lit up intermittently by flashes of lightning. It was beautiful in a way, but there was something unnerving about it. The air felt charged, heavy. I grabbed the binoculars and scanned the horizon. Nothing unusual, just the storm creeping closer. I tried to go back to bed, but sleep wouldn't come. The wind howled louder, the tower swayed slightly, and then I heard it, the unmistakable crack of lightning hitting somewhere nearby. I shot out of bed and went to the window. A plume of smoke was rising just a few miles to the east, near a dry patch of forest I'd had my eye on. Immediately, I grabbed the radio and reported the coordinates. This is Tower 17, reporting a strike about eight miles east of my position possible fire starting in Section 22B. I waited for a response, but all I got was static. 
the storm was interfering with the signal. I tried again, but the radio hissed and popped. Frustrated, I threw on my jacket and grabbed my flashlight. I needed to get down from the tower and see if I could hike to a spot where the signal might be clearer. The storm was picking up strength. As I made my way down the narrow steps of the tower, the wind whipped at my jacket, and rain began to fall in heavy sheets. I slipped on the wet steps more than once, but I made it to the ground without any serious mishaps. My flashlight barely caught through the thick darkness, but I knew the trail well enough to find my way. As I walked through the trees, the sound of the wind was deafening. I had never felt so small. The forest, which had always felt like a sanctuary, now seemed like it was closing in on me. Trees groaned and creaked under the pressure of the wind, branches snapped, and the underbrush rustled with the sound of animals fleeing the storm. I hiked for about twenty minutes, hoping to get to a higher elevation where the radio signal might cut through the interference. The rain soaked me to the bone, and I cursed under my breath. I stopped on a ridge and pulled out the radio again, hoping for a break in the static. I clicked the button. Tower 17 to base, can you hear me? I've got a fire starting in section 22B. Need confirmation. Silence. Then, through the hiss of the storm, a voice came through, garbled but recognizable. Can't hear, fire, hold position. I was about to respond when a sound stopped me in my tracks. It wasn't the wind, or the thunder, or the rain. It was a low, rumbling sound, distant but unmistakable, the sound of a wildfire. I had heard it before, that dull roar that could only come from a wall of flames consuming everything in its path. My stomach dropped. I looked back in the direction I had come from, the tower now completely obscured by the storm. The fire was growing fast, and I was right in its path. I had no choice but to turn around and head back, hoping I could make it to the tower before the fire got too close. I ran. My boots slipped on the muddy ground, my flashlight flickered, but I kept going. The roar of the fire grew louder, and the wind carried the unmistakable scent of smoke. The fire was moving fast, too fast. I could see the glow of the flames now, flickering through the trees in the distance. I pushed myself harder, my lungs burning, my legs aching. By the time I reached the tower, the fire was close. Too close. I could see the flames licking at the edge of the forest, less than a mile away. I scrambled up the steps of the tower, my hands shaking. I needed to get a better view, assess the situation, and figure out my next move. From the top of the tower, the view was terrifying. The fire was a massive wall of orange and red, roaring through the trees, devouring everything in its path. I grabbed the binoculars and scanned the area. It was worse than I thought, the fire wasn't just coming from the east. It had circled around, cutting off the only road out. I was trapped. I grabbed the radio again, desperately hoping for a response. Tower 17 to base, the fire surrounding me. I'm trapped up here, need immediate evacuation. More static. Then, finally, a crackle of a voice. Can't, fire, hold, evacuation on the way. I didn't have time to wait. The fire was moving too fast. The heat was unbearable, even from the tower, and I could see embers flying through the air, carried by the wind. I grabbed my emergency pack, a small bag with a fire blanket, some basic supplies, and a flare, and prepared to make a run for it. I didn't know where I was going, but staying in the tower wasn't an option anymore. Just as I was about to descend the steps, I heard something, a different sound, one that didn't belong to the storm or the fire. It was a voice. A man's voice, faint but distinct coming from somewhere in the forest below. Help, someone, help, I froze. It was impossible. There shouldn't have been anyone out here. 
No one was supposed to be within miles of this place. But there it was again, clearer this time. Help me, I scanned the ground with my flashlight, but the smoke made it hard to see. The fire was closing in fast, and I didn't have time to think. Against my better judgment, I grabbed the flare and threw it as hard as I could in the direction of the voice. It lit up the forest in a red glow, casting eerie shadows on the trees. There was movement. A figure, stumbling through the underbrush, headed toward the tower. I ran down the steps, my heart pounding in my chest. The figure was getting closer, but something wasn't right. The way he moved, it was jerky, unnatural, like he was struggling just to stay on his feet. When he finally emerged from the smoke, I could see why. He was covered in burns, his clothes singed and hanging off him in tatters. His skin was blackened and blistered, and his eyes were wide with terror. Please, he rasped, collapsing at the base of the tower. Help, I knelt beside him, unsure of what to do. He was in bad shape, barely conscious, and the fire was almost on us. I pulled the fire blanket out of my pack and wrapped it around him, but I knew it wasn't enough. We needed to move, and fast. I looked up at the sky, hoping to see a helicopter, something that could get us out of here. But there was nothing. Just smoke and flames. The fire was less than a hundred yards away now, and I could feel the heat searing my skin. I grabbed the man by the shoulders and tried to lift him, but he was too heavy. I was about to give up when I heard the sound of rotors, faint at first but growing louder. A helicopter, silhouetted against the flames, appeared through the smoke. They had found us.